Welcome again, everybody. I think we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Bill Cavanaugh. I'm the director of the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology at DePaul University. Uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. I know uh, it's Mardi Gras and the State of the Union address tonight, so we've got some competition, but if you can hold off on the Mardi Gras revelry until after the talk, that would be great. We, um, this talk is part of a series we have on immigrant Catholicism in the United States this year. The focus of the center is on Catholicism in the global south, uh, Africa, Asia, Latin America. But um, this year we're focusing on the global church in the United States. And so uh, number two in our series is uh, from uh, Father Peter Fan, And we're just delighted to have Peter with us uh, tonight. Peter is the Aya Korea Chair of Catholic Social Thought at Georgetown University. Uh, Ignacio Ayacaria was a Jesuit priest, the president of the University of Central America, a distinguished philosopher, and a tireless advocate of social justice in El Salvador. Um, and he and his housemates were all murdered by uh, Salvadoran troops in 1989. Uh, and so it's it's remarkable that um, there is a chair in Catholic social thought named after Ignacio Ayacaria, and Father Peter Fan is a worthy inaugural holder of that chair because he continues the work of Catholic social thought and the pursuit of social justice uh, as well. Peter is not only the go-to guy on Vietnamese Catholicism, but he is a very distinguished uh, professor of Catholic social thought more generally and the winner of many awards. Uh, he has three doctorates. One is not good enough, nor is two. You've got to go for three doctorates. And he has published 30 books, 300 articles, and continues uh, to be productive uh, and uh, uh, a distinguished scholar in the field of Catholic social thought. So welcome. Peter. Yes. Okay. I am. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, to uh, Bill Kavanaugh for the invitation to address to you this evening. I am so grateful for the possibility of talking about Vietnamese Catholics in the United States. I myself am a refugee. I came to the United States in 1975 when the south of Vietnam fell to the north communist uh, Vietnam. And about, as I will mention later on, at the time about 225,000 Vietnamese escaped in the month of April and May of 1975. So I will talk about the Vietnamese American Catholics. Who are we and what we do? On the screen, you can see the outline of my talk tonight. I am told to stay within 45 minutes, which I will do. And these are the topics I will deal with. So you can look at it, and then we can remove that later on, and then we uh, will go. First of all, I will talk about briefly about the Portuguese, the Spanish, and the French missionaries in Vietnam, because it was they who introduced Catholicism in Vietnam with very different characteristics from Portuguese, Spanish, and French missionaries. Secondly, I will give you some of the overview of the Catholic Church in Vietnam today, how many of them, what they do, and so forth, the problem they have with the government and so forth. And the third thing, I will speak very briefly about the Protestant churches, because Christianity is not only Catholic, but also all the denominations. There is a good number of Protestant churches in Vietnam. And then I will speak about the other religions which, uh, with which Christianity has to enter to dialogue with. I talk about Buddhism, Gaudaism, perhaps you haven't heard of this, but I will talk about them. This is something new for you, and popular re religiosity, particularly devotion to Mary. That is, 
And then finally, I will go a little bit longer on the relation with the communist government in Vietnam. So let's move to the next point. Would you please set, uh, set up the map of Vietnam so I can show the listeners what uh, we are talking about. Here you have, wonderful. So you have here the map of Vietnam. Vietnam is in Southeast Asia. And you can see from the shape in Vietnamese, you always say that the Vietnam is like a capital S, look like it, you see. On the north, you have the capital Hanoi. And in the middle, you have the uh, Hue, which is the, uh, uh, the, the part right here, Hue. And then in the south, way south, we have the Ho Chi Minh City. It used to be known Saigon. But when the communists took over in 1975, they changed the name of the capital in honor of the founder of Vietnamese communism, Ho Chi Minh. So keep this in mind as I move along. And I will uh, just keep that, uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, map on for a while. Now, the uh, Christianity came to Vietnam in the 17th century uh, with first the Jesuit. The Jesuit came to Vietnam in 1625 around. So they all stay, the Jesuits stay in the center of Vietnam, near Hue, not the north, near Hue. And from there, they eventually moved to Hanoi in 1627, and then developed all throughout the country. Now, I've mentioned the Spanish and the Portuguese. Why were they there for the first time in 17th century? The Christian missionary at the time, mostly, almost exclusively uh, Jesuits. There were a few Dominicans, Franciscans, Capuchins, Carmelites, but most of them, most of the missionaries were Jesuits. So we owe a lot to the Jesuit as they were the founder of Vietnamese Christianity. Among the Jesuit of the 17th century, there was a man by the name of Alexandre de Rode. He was French, uh, but they, uh, uh, he, came, he became a Jesuit, went to Rome, became a novice, a Jesuit, and then he volunteered to go to Asia. And at first he was uh, given, he was supposed to go to Japan, but in the beginning of the 17th century, there were severe persecutions in Japan. So his superiors, who were then in Macau, sent him to Vietnam in 1626, about that time. And there were about five or six Jesuits there. And if you look at the map, you see Da Nang, Da Nang in the middle of the, of the map, and you can see near a little bit north of it, you have uh, where the Jesuits stay. Most of the Jesuits stay there. And what happened with the Jesuits is this, that they were very, most of them were under the Portuguese uh, sponsorship. The word is patronado, the sponsorship. That is, the Portuguese government would pay their way. You know, they traveled by ship in those days. They would pay for the building of churches and so forth. Uh, as a uh, reward for it, as an exchange for it, they had the right to nominate bishops, okay? Uh, not ordain them, but nominate bishops. So the nomination of bishops belonged to the right and the privilege of Portugal in Vietnam. In South America, Latin America, it was a, it is the privilege of Spain. So Spain has a, the the patronage, the patronage in uh, South America, and with the exception is the Philippines. The Philippines belong to the Spanish patronage. The rest, Japan, China, Macau, Vietnam belong to the Portuguese. So that gives you a sense. Now, in the beginning of, towards the beginning of the 19th century, 1802, 1802, the, uh, there was the last Vietnamese emperor, uh, the, the last 
dynasty. And the first emperor is uh, Nguyen Am, the Vietnamese is name. And at first, he was very much the first emperor of the Nguyen dynasty. If you know in Vietnamese, many of them had the name Nguyen because at the time, uh, the people take the name of the dynasty at the time. So Nguyen dynasty, so the majority of Vietnamese uh, last name is also Nguyen. Doesn't mean that they are uh, related to the emperor, but they simply take the name to honor the emperor Nguyen. By the year 18, 20, 1820, there were huge persecutions of Vietnamese Catholics. Uh, they were regarded by the uh, dynasty, the Vietnamese dynasty, as, uh, as we say, traitors or following the religion of outsiders, for the religion rather the Vietnamese religions. So they persecuted them from 1820 to about 1880, so about 60 years of heavy persecution of Vietnamese Catholics. Now, during that time, during that time there were a lot of French missionaries. Uh, when the uh, Portuguese, uh, the Pacific Portuguese lost their uh, military power, colonial power, it was sub, uh, supplanted, uh, succeeded by the French, and so the French missionary come in after the Portuguese, and most of these French, when they were uh, in Vietnam, they were very much protected by the French government. And when the Vietnamese emperor persecuted the Vietnamese Catholics, and of course the Vietnamese uh, the missionaries, France used that as an excuse to invade Vietnam. So it, it's the story we hear today from Russia and Ukraine. Ukraine, it's the same thing, France invaded Vietnam. And so France took over Vietnam, the north, they call it Tonkin, the south, they call it Annam, and the, at the center, they call it Annam, and the south, they call it Cochin China. So Vietnam then, in the 19th century, was divided into three parts. The north, Hanoi, Tonkin, the center, Annam, and then the south, uh, you have Cochin, China. Now, with the arrival of the French missionaries, we were Vietnam was introduced to a new kind of spirituality, the French spirituality as distinguished from the Portuguese spirituality. Okay. Today in Vietnam, uh, the, the situation, contemporary situation in Vietnam, we have about, the population is near 100 million, not quite, but about 80, 85, about that number. And Catholics made up about 7% of the population, 7% of the population, uh, the Vietnamese. And altogether, there are 27 dioceses. 27 dioceses, including three archdioceses, the one in Hanoi, the north, the one in the center is Hue, and the one in the south is Ho Chi Minh. There are three archdioceses, and the other may altogether 27 archdioceses. Okay? Now, you see the first thing is, I show you the Cathedral of Saigon. This is the Cathedral of Saigon, or Ho Chi Minh City. It was built in the 19th century with the French money. The French government paid for this building. So it's, if you go to Saigon, uh, we say today you go to Ho Chi Minh City, the first thing you see is the cathedral. That's cathedral built to us the, mid, the middle of the 19th century. Uh, the statue of Our Lady in front, that, that, that it's a, a very iconic uh, building. Uh, when you move to the, uh, the next one, here is the St. Joseph Cathedral in Hanoi. Um, you can see it, it's much older and uh, not well maintained and so forth, but that is the Cathedral of Hanoi. So do, I do not have the Cathedral of Hue. Hue has a very small cathedral. It's not uh, as old as the one of Hanoi and of Saigon of the 19th century. Where is a small one, so I didn't have any fault to show you that. But let, to let you know, there is about uh, in Vietnam these 27 dioceses and 2,228 priests and 2,000. 
668 non-assisted. Now, the map you just look at now, I'd like to go a little bit, a bit about the other religions in Vietnam so you have an idea what they are, okay? Now, you look at Catholicism, number red, the red number is 6.9, so I said 7.0%, okay? 7% are the population. The next largest group is the Buddhist, uh, the, the, the largest one is the Buddhist, 11.7%, so 12% of about 85, 90 million people are Buddhist. And then there is the Protestantism, there is the uh, violet color there, you can see it, violet color. And then you have the Calvinism. I will talk to you about it. I will show some picture of it later on after this. I will talk about it because I suppose most of you do not know much about Calvinism. And then you have the Hoahoism. It's another type of Buddhism. It's a smaller sect of Buddhism. It belongs to Buddhism. And then Islam. It's very small, 0.1%. The rest is, we call it, folk religions. Well, they do not belong to any institutional religions like Buddhism, Catholicism, Catholicism, and so forth. Folk religions basically believe that there is, there are spirits, maybe even God, but spirits, and there are ways of pleasing, placating and pleasing the spirit, offer the sacrifices, the food, and so, particularly in the uh, at the time of funeral. Funeral in Vietnam is very solemn. It's not like in the United States. It's a big celebration in the last a week or so. And you have a lot of practices by folk religions who believe that their parents continue to need their support in terms of food, clothing, and housing, and all that. And then they, they are the folk religions is the largest one, almost 70% of that. Okay, let's move to the next one. Okay, here is one very famous Buddhist. His name is Thich Nhat Han. Thich is the name for a monk, Buddhist monk. Uh, and New Han, he is very well known in the United States. He was uh, in the 1960s, he fought against the war. He was a pacifist and the government sent him out to the United States and he could never come back. He was studying at Princeton, at Columbia, and then he stayed on until 1975 when the country fell. He couldn't go home, he stayed here. And then he went to uh, uh, France, in the southwest part of France called Bordeaux, the, the region that produced a lot of red wine. He established a village called the Plum Village, and he taught people there, people come in and listen to him. And his idea of what we call it uh, awareness, consciousness. Whenever you do something, just be aware. Self-awareness and peace. Those are the two things that he very much promulgated. About a month ago, uh, he died uh, at the age of eight, 94, so very old. And uh, it, it, it just really, he is a symbol of Vietnamese Buddhism, at least for outsiders, for the uh, foreign countries. This is the guy that uh, we always, he wrote so many books. If you are interested in his writing, you can look at his name, New Hat, uh, uh, this is Vietnamese name. All right, that's the next uh, slide I will talk about. Here is... Let me talk about the Khao Dai, the, or in the city called Tây Ninh. Tây Ninh is way south of Vietnam. It's a, it's a large city between Cambodia and Vietnam. Now, who are, what is the meaning of Khao Dai and what they do? Khao Dai literally means high throne, a very high throne, Khao Dai. It was uh, established in the 1940s or so in, the, in South Vietnam, there was a man who believed that he has received a revelation, a revelation to found a new religion. But this new religion is a mixture, we call it the uh, combination of syncretism, I wish to use the word syncretism, of Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Confucianism, and Taoism. Every religion that was well known in Vietnam at the time, he combined together 
and at the center of the uh, at the heart of the belief is belief in the one God. So we think of Islam, Christianity, Judaism, the monotheistic belief, belief in one God. So that's the centerpiece of the Kaudai, the one God. And second idea of the Kaudai is that the harmony of religion. So religion should not be fighting against each other, but somehow to come together. So the idea of using all different elements of all the major religions to found this religion. And the third thing is that they are very socially minded. But socially mad, very much in social justice. They help each other in terms of uh, uh, food and, and all kinds of jobs and all kinds. So the social, the, the monotheism, the harmony of religion, second point, the third point is social justice. So if you go to take uh, Khao Dai, you can see this building there. Now, if you go there, you enter that, you can see all of them, uh, two groups, men on one side, women on the other side. They all wear white. And the, uh, the organization of this Tao Dai religion is exactly the same as that of the Catholic Church. They also have a pope. They have many cardinals. They have many bishops. And there are many priests. And then, of course, the laity. So uh, Khao Dai, the founder of Khao Dai, took over the uh, hierarchy, the hierarchical organization, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, and uh, applied to that. So as I said, in Vietnam, uh, they, they have the same title as Pope, Cardinals, Bishop, Priest, and then the Lady. So I would like you to see that this is a native uh, religion of Vietnam. Christianity is a religion that brought from outside. Buddhism is also a, a religion brought from India and China. How the, uh, the Taoism is also a religion brought from uh, China and Confucianism. Only the one religion that is truly indigenous, founded by a Vietnamese for the Vietnamese is Khao Dai. Uh, literally, as I said, meaning high throne the throne upon which God sits. So that's why they tell that. All right, that's next one. Uh, Islam, as I said, is only 0.1%, so it's very small. Uh, so, but at least you have a, 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 a temple uh, um, uh, that you have. Uh, of, they are not very big, very small, but still it's good to have that. The title, the, the name on the, on the gate is Tandur, uh, meaning church, holy church of Islam. Okay, so that's it. All right, let's move now to my second part, is uh, this part about the Vietnamese Catholics in the United States. So this is my second part of my presentation. First of all, where do we come from? How many of us came? Where do we live? Okay, you can see there the picture of the, the, the statue of Our Lady of La Vang. I will keep there for a while as I talk, and then as I will move into Our Lady of La Vang, we will see different uh, photos of this Our Lady of La Vang, a very uh, distinctive devotion of the Vietnamese. Now, let me first of all talk about how many Vietnamese Catholics in, 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 in the United States. As I said before, uh, before 1975, there were a few Vietnamese in the United States. Almost all of them were students at the university, so a very small group. But since 1975, when the South fell to the communists in the North, about 250,000, as I said, 250,000 left Vietnam and became refugees uh, in the United States. I, as I said, I and my family were among them. We settled in, uh, most of us settled in California and Camp Pendleton, which is a um, Marine Corps camp. And we have from May to August, maybe almost beginning of September, uh, Thousands, thousands of Vietnamese were coming in there. I was there for two months to help people and there. And then the other place is in Pennsylvania, Indian, Indian Town Gap, a smaller one, and then in Arkansas. There are three places, but mostly California, where the Vietnamese came. So as I said, beginning about 250,000. But after that, after that, 
there were a lot of people who were known as the boat people, boat people, that is the people who escaped Vietnam by taking the boat, the, the ship literally, and a lot of them were drowned in the ocean and so forth. Most of them tried to go to the Philippines or Indonesia, Philippine Indonesia, because that is our nearest uh, destination if you go by boat. So now in the United States, in the United States, there are about 2,000, uh, sorry, 2 million 200 Vietnamese. 2 million 200 Vietnamese. Most of them live in California, in uh, San Jose, uh, Orange County. Yeah, it's, um, the, in Orange County, there's a small town called Little Saigon. If you have the chance to go there, it's about maybe two or three um, uh, acres large. There you have the statue there. In, in, uh, this is not in California. This is in um, Maryland. I will talk. Just keep this picture there for a while. And um, the other states, large state is Texas and then Louisiana and then New York. Those are the states that have more Vietnamese than other states, of course, in Georgia, in Maryland, in Virginia, but the largest number of Vietnamese are in California. You can go there uh, at the, the city called Little Saigon. You could live there without knowing a word of English. Everything is in Vietnamese. You have a restaurant, you have business, you have churches, pagodas, everything in Vietnamese. So that's one place where you can really live like in Vietnam. Literally, there's no need of speaking of a, a word of English to survive there. All right? Out of 2,200,000 Vietnamese in America, we have about now about half a million Vietnamese Catholics, Vietnamese Catholics. So have about half a million Vietnamese Catholics. Um, it is very interesting. Out of 2.2 million, we have half a million Vietnamese Catholics. In Vietnam, you have uh, almost 100 million and you have only 7 million. So the proportion is huge in the United States. Uh, all, almost two-thirds were uh, Vietnamese Catholics. As I said, where they live, mostly in California, in Texas, Louisiana, uh, th this is the main place. Right now, we have one Vietnamese Catholic, uh, sorry, uh, one Vietnamese bishop who lives in uh, Orange County, almost a thousand Vietnamese priests. That's a huge number. That's a number larger than most number of priests in any diocese. And over even a larger number of sisters as well. So the Vietnamese Catholic Church in the United States is strong, is alive and well. Um, the one particular uh, characteristics of the Vietnamese American Catholic Church is that they we have a lot of vocations, so-called vocations, to the priesthood and to religious life. This is something that uh, Vietnamese are very proud of, um, whereas in many other places, the number of clergy, vocation to the priesthood, vocation to religious life have diminished. The Vietnamese uh, have uh, still a strong number of uh, vocation, priestly vocation, that is, uh, to serve the people as, as priests and so forth. As I said, there's one Vietnamese bishop uh, in California. So that gives you an idea of what, where we are, what we do now, uh, the Catholics in Vietnam. Um, the Next question I'd like to ask is what is the characteristic thing? If you look at the Vietnamese Catholics uh, in Vietnam or in the United States, what is the, the thing that jump out to your, to your uh, uh, eyes? That's what you are looking at, the Our Lady of Lavan. Okay, so I'd like to speak quickly about this before I can uh, stop for you. Our Lady Lavang, Lavang is a small village, a small village north of Hue, about 80 kilometers north of Hue. Hue is the center, okay, north of it. Now, this is the story. 
that has been told to us. We have no historical evidence at all, no document, but this is a story we, we knew about. Actually, there are two stories about Our Lady of Lavan. So the first story is this. In 1798, towards the end of the 18th century, there was a lot of persecutions of Vietnamese Catholics by the king. The capital was at Hue. And so the Vietnamese Catholics then run away from Hue to a small village at called La Vang. La Vang, L-A-V-A-N, okay? And they stayed there, and every night they would recite the rosary under a banyan tree, a big banyan tree. And one day they saw a lady appear to them, dressed in white, walking up and down, and she was carrying with her a baby. And both sides of her, uh, there was one angel, another angel on the right, another angel on the left, and hold her candle. And she walked back and forth, back and forth. And the people didn't know who she was. And finally, one day it was said that she was, uh, she said to them in a very sweet voice, she said, I will grant you whatever you ask, uh, but particularly if any one of you have any illness, sickness, disease, you come here and I will heal you. So this is the story, the story of a lady with a baby, with the angels, appeared to the persecuted Catholics and assuring them, assuring them that she will take care of them and, and heal them. It's very interesting that in this apparition, there was not an individual person that stood out like we have a Lord, uh, Bernadette de Subiru, or in Fatima, three young children elsewhere. This is an almost apparition to a, an anonymous group, a huge group of people, hundreds of people there. So that's one. A second difference is that Our Lady here in this case did not have any particular message to convey to them. Uh, for example, at uh, Lourdes, you have the story, the, 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 the message that she is immaculate conception. She was conceived without original sin. That is one of the things that she conveyed to the Bernadette Subiru or to the three children at Fatima, you pray for the conversion of Russia. Those are the, here, no, there is no particular uh, uh, message to convey. They simply say the care of the people in a difficulty in sickness and persecution. Now, if any one of you know a little bit about Buddhist uh, iconography and uh, the story of Buddhism, you probably remember the the uh, a, a figure called Quan Yin. Quan Yin. It's literally, I hear your voice, Li Guan Yin. Uh, it started in China and then came to the, uh, sorry, it, it started in uh, Japan and then it migrated to China and then from China it migrated to Vietnam. So Guan Yin is often called the Buddhist of mercy, the Buddhist goddess of mercy. If you go to any pagoda, any Buddhist pagoda, you will find a statue of Guan Yin, the Buddhist goddess of mercy. Now the Vietnamese, when they look at this statue, uh, and they, um, within the connection with the context of Buddhism, they say, ah, this is what the Buddhists believe. The Buddhists believe in Guan Yin. We Catholics, we have also a Guan Yin, a uh, goddess of mercy because she takes care of us. Huh? So that's one. Will you move to the next uh, uh, paint, uh, photograph of Our Lady? Okay, so you have another one here. It's in color, the same thing. Uh, typical, her, her head is a Vietnamese hat for women, but they wear it particularly during wedding. That is very, very large, usually gold or red. And then you have the statue of Jesus. And then the, the, the color of blue, light blue and white. So it's very much a Vietnamese representation of Our Lady of Lavan. 
the next one that you have. Do you have the next pen? Okay, not yet. So stop there. Stop there for a while. Now, the second story, I said the uh, Our Lady of Lava have two stories. The first story is the persecution of Vietnamese Catholics, and Our Lady appeared to them and assuring them that she would take care of them. The second story is a little bit more interesting. The story is that at the same place, at the same place, there were some uh, Buddhist monks who wanted to build a pagoda to honor their uh, Buddha. Right, so they built a pagoda, and then they put in a statue of the Buddha in the in that pagoda. At night, at night, they were told in a dream the Buddha appeared to them and say, "Go to the temple, remove my statue, because there's someone there more powerful than I." Okay. The monk did not believe that, so they just uh, keep the statue of the Buddha to in the temple. The following night, they also have the same dream. They say the the Buddha appeared to them, say, "Go and remove my statue from the temple because there is one lady who is more powerful than me than I." And so the, they came to the when they woke up, they walked to the temple and they saw the statue of the Buddha already move outside of the of the building, just put aside. And so the Buddhist asked, "Who is this lady more powerful than the Buddha?" And the Catholic would say, "Well, you know, we believe here there's Our Lady of Lavan." So they say, "Okay, we give you the temple. Well, we just give you the temple, and you can do it." Uh, use it for your worship. This is another story. Uh, we don't have historical evidence for this kind of story, the first story and the second story. Nevertheless, uh, the Vietnamese Catholics are very strongly devout to Our Lady of La Vang. Every year, uh, there is a huge, huge uh, procession. They get there and pray and have the mass or the bishop came there and everyone, the priests, thousands of priests were there and 67, sometimes even 100,000 Vietnamese Catholics show up in this place called Our Lady of La Van. Once a year they, they go there. At first the communist government was opposed to it, but later on they realized that there was nothing that they could do because so many people want to go, so they let it go, let, allow them to, to do. Now, let me then go to the uh, following uh, paintings of a photo to show you something. Okay, this is one Vietnamese uh, church in Phoenix, Arizona. Now, notice, notice the, the roof. The roof, at the end of the, of the roof, there is a bending up. This is very typical of Vietnamese architecture. It shows the uh, the raising of the, the 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 whole wall up to heaven. So that is one very interesting that is in Phoenix, Arizona. Okay, the next one. All right, the, these are. Can you go back if they have some? On um, go back the uh, before the painting. Another one. Can you go back to the that one? Wow. This is the Vietnamese Catholic Center in Orange County. The, this is interesting. You look at the architecture. The roof is always spinning up. All the four corners, everything is raised to heaven. And you have three, three, three levels. For usually for the Buddhists, it's seven levels. But the Catholic is three in honor of the Trinity, as it were. And you have there the residence of the Vietnamese bishop who, who, um, uh, Worked there most of the time. This is the center, uh, the, the 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 most well known in California. You go to California, want to visit the Catholic. This is the center you go. It is not a church. It's not a church. It's just simply a center for uh, administration, for organization, and so forth. And uh, please go to the last photograph, last one. Okay, here it is. I want to tell you that uh, the uh, Vietnamese are not only Catholics, they were also Protestants, so we need to pay a, uh, uh, honor to them. The Vietnamese uh, Protestants are smaller than the, uh, than the Catholics, much smaller, but they are very active. Many of them, the majority of them, are Pentecostals or Evangelicals. They very much 
uh, devoted to a witness to Jesus, witness uh, through the gospel and preaching. This is in California. We have a center there, a church. But notice, you notice that the Vietnamese churches have Vietnamese architecture with the roof like made up like a pagoda. The Baptist, the Protestant do not do that because they do not believe that they should somehow adopt the Vietnamese architectural style, much less some kind of remind them of a Buddhist structure. So here you have a typical maybe New England or typical uh, American church. And so you don't find any Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese Protestant churches that, uh, that, that are built in the Vietnamese style. Whereas most of the Vietnamese churches in the United States are built in the Vietnamese style. Uh, 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 if you don't know, you can think it is uh, Vietnamese baptism. Let me conclude before I give you uh, exact time. Um, the Vietnamese uh, Catholics in the United States, I said about half a million of them, are very, very attached to the Vietnamese Catholic Church in Vietnam. Uh, living abroad, does not cut off relationships and love and care for the Vietnamese people and the Vietnamese Catholic Church. Any time there is any disaster, natural disaster, like tsunami or, or, or uh, weather-related flood and so forth, the Vietnamese Catholics are very active in raising funds, money, and to help them. And uh, the fact that today, uh, even under a communist regime, Vietnam is still a communist country, only three countries that are communists in, Vietnam, in the world, China, Korea, Vietnam, or in Asia. Uh, so you have the, uh, the Vietnamese Catholic Church has developed a way of existing, coexisting with the Vietnamese communist government. The Vietnamese communist government appreciate the work, especially social and educational work of the Vietnamese Catholics, and uh, particularly in the care of the sick, of the handicapped, of uh, um, lepers and so forth. So the Vietnamese in Vietnam are well known for their work of charity, social justice and social work. So that's where I'd like to end today. I hope to give you already some idea of first what Vietnam is, Vietnamese Catholic and Vietnamese American Catholic. So if you have any questions, I would uh, be happy to answer them. So, Bill, uh, unmute yourself. Unmute. There. All right, Bill. Okay, you you still yeah. Okay, you unmute. I'm I'm trying to unmute myself. Am, am I unmuted now? Yes, okay, yeah, you are now. I was getting a message saying the host is not letting me, uh -huh. letting me unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> but uh, now I'm now I'm live. Now uh, right. Thank you so much, Peter. That was really interesting. Yeah. Uh, and I learned a lot. Um, so let me say uh, to all of the attendees here, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A, and I will relay as many as possible uh, to Peter. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and open that up and start that process uh, now. We've already got uh, several questions here. So, um the first question is, what was the main religion or belief system before Catholicism arrived in the um, 18th century? Yeah, uh, 17th century. 17th century. The, okay. okay. We have to distinguish between official religion and the common religion. Before the coming of Christianity in the 17th century, early part of the 17th century, 1625, the government espouses Confucianism. Confucianism was regarded as the religious uh, worldview that can be very helpful for the government. For example, uh, 
Confucianism insists on loyalty to the king. And if you are a king, then you find it's very helpful to make Confucianism your official ideology or religion. Uh, another thing that helped Confuc uh, uh, the Vietnam is the fact of examinations. In order to get a government job, right, by a judge or some a general or something, you have to pass through the exam, three exams, three exams. You pass the first one, second one, the third one, you took, you take the exam in the, um, uh, in the capital of the empire, Hue. And therefore, people who are educated, who want to have a official high official job, they would follow what we call Confucianism. On the popular level, there are two. There were two religions. One is Buddhism. And Buddhism teaches them that life, the world, is unreal, is suffering. And the only way to overcome suffering is to ab abandon, to ab extinguish desire. Because if you desire something, you may have it. And after you have it a while, you get more with it. Or if you don't get it, you get also suffer. So either way, either you get it or you do not get it, desire is the origin of your suffering. And that, and then you have the pagoda where people can go, not every day, not every week, but occasionally, for example, at a new year, at your uh, wedding, a funeral, particularly funeral, you need the Buddhist monk to come in and pray for you. So that's one group. And then you have the third, so you have Confucianism at the official uh, level, at the level of the people you have Buddhism, and then you have Conf uh, Taoism. Taoism comes from the Tao Te Ching, the book called Tao Te Ching. And the Tao Te Ching teaches you that there is, the, uh, the important thing is to maintain the balance, not one way too much, one way another one, the harmony of life, harmony with nature, harmony with yourself, harmony with the others. So people also love this religion because they respond to their needs. Uh, if you are a farmer, you are a farmer, most of the people were farmers at the time, they need to have good weather, uh, good sunshine, good water, and so forth. So Taoism would be the, the religion that would follow. If you overcome your pain, your suffering, and so forth, you go to Buddhism. And if you want to go to government, uh, we call it today administration, uh, work for the White House, work for the government, you have to have Confucianism. So this is the thing that is most. Now, you, you, you ask the number. I, I said, very hard to say, because in Vietnam, we have the expression called Tam Zhao, meaning three religions. They are not separated. You may be a Taoist when you go to the uh, to, to, to the uh, fields and so on. You may be a Buddhist when you need a funeral. And you may be a Confucianist when you are going to take exam to, for government jobs. So it is not something totally distinguished. Now, when Christianity came in the uh, 17th century, it became the fourth religion. Tu uh, Zhao, fourth religion. No, not Tam, Tam in three three religions, now the fourth one. And the difference between Christianity is that Christianity is very exclusive. You are either Christian or you are not, you are something else. You cannot be both a uh, Christian and a Buddhist, a Christian and a Taoist. So Christianity introduced this notion of exclusivity. Whereas before that, before the 17th century, a person can be all of them. You can be a Buddhist, you can be a Taoist, you can be a Confucianist, uh, and it's no, no problem. So I hope that answers your question. Great. Thank you, Peter. So the next question is from uh, one of my students. We've been talking a lot about enculturation and syncretism in mm -hmm. our class, uh, Intro to World Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And Evan asks, what are some instances of enculturation or syncretism that you've noticed uh, in Catholicism uh, in Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, so maybe an another part of that question might be, you, you pointed out how um, Protestants tend to shy away from enculturation, yeah. whereas yeah. Catholics tend to embrace it. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Why? Why? Absolutely right, uh, Bill. Um, first of all, I already mentioned Catholicism, right? Catholicism is a typical example of religious syncretism. It takes from everywhere. It takes from Christianity, 
from Taoism, Confucianism, and, and, and Buddhism, and even French literature, French history. Victor Hugo, uh, the, the French uh, 19th century novelist, is also venerated by them, which is very strange. Uh, but but they, they venerated Victor Hugo uh, as, as a, a good man. So you have, uh, you want to talk about a case par excellence of Vietnamese syncretism, you have to look at Cao Daism, okay? So that's number one. Number two, as Bill said, I only mentioned that there is a difference between the Vietnamese Catholics and Vietnamese Protestants regarding the use of native symbols, native ideas, native architecture, native art, and so forth. Uh, the Catholics uh, have a very strong inclination towards inculturation, that is, in Uh, interpreting and in adapting Christianity in a way that is understandable to the people. So, for example, translation of the Bible is also one part of inculturation. When you translate the Bible, you have to use the kind of words. Sometimes they do not exist in Vietnamese. You have to in, uh, coin that word, so you have to use the word that is some similar but is never identical with the Christian idea of that. So this is the work of inculturation. Uh, the Catholic, why do Catholic think of that, do that way? Because Catholic believe that there is something good and holy in all religions and in all cultures. As Sargantu said, something holy and uh, a good, good and holy. So the, when the Catholic came, uh, they look at the culture and the native religions and they say, What is there that is so good? What is there that is so proper that we can use them in order to translate, in order to accommodate, in order to inculture our Christian faith? And that is a very optimistic view of human culture and human religion. Of course, Catholic knows there's elements of sin, of course, evil and so forth. They, they know that. So they do not take all elements just without any kind of critical judgment. They do that kind. What can be incorporated, which are not being... I gave an example. Uh, do you see? When Alexander Rod, uh, 17th century, went to Vietnam, the first thing he noticed that many Vietnamese have uh, men have many wives we call it polygamy and he looked at it he said well you know there is some reason for this because th if the women have not a husband they would be hopeless nobody would take care of them so the uh, polygamy could be seen a, a way in which the Vietnamese take care of all people, the, the women uh, and the children and so forth. But they realized, he realized that it's not permit, uh, permissible to Catholics. So he required that Catholics at the time, uh, Vietnamese at the time, who want to become Catholic, have to renounce the other wives. Okay? So that is one condition he made. So uh, he can go only that far and not far, uh, only that much, he cannot further. Uh, so that's an example for you to, to think. Uh, and this is not just one Vietnam, in Africa, the same thing, the same issue. Now, the Protestant have a much more negative view of culture. Yes, they recognize something good, but mostly they see something as superstition. The word they use very often in describing other religions is sub, uh, 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 superstition. And so they tend not to be open to uh, uh, inculturation. And I give a real example in architecture. The architect, you go to Vietnam, you could hardly distinguish a church from a pagoda, except the cross on top. That, if you see the cross, you know that's not a pagoda. But look at the other way, you cannot sell it. It's a pagoda. So that's one. But as I said, the Protestant would never uh, build a church that way. All right? So there are limits to it. It's, it's a, a discerned, critical judgment of which element of the culture can be taken, which cannot be. Thank you, Peter. That's that's brilliant. Yeah, um, we've been talking a lot about that. Like, what are the criteria to yeah. use? Um, what's a good enculturation and what's not a good enculturation? 
Um, we've got just an observation from uh, one of the participants who says that he lives in the Tucson area and has taken his family to the Vietnamese Catholic Church in Phoenix and found it very beautiful and powerful. Um, another uh, person coming from San Jose, and she is asking, what is the size of the Vietnamese community here? And what is their history with the former bishop, Pierre Dumain? Oh, <laughs> well, that is a very, very hard, uh, sad question. Uh, there were, I, I got that to be asked, uh, uh, because I was also somewhat involved in that uh, affair as myself. Uh, when the Vietnamese arrived in California, the, the American bishop in California only, in California only, did not permit a separate Vietnamese Catholic parish. Okay? That's one rule. The, the American bishop wanted the Vietnamese to be incorporated into the American parish. No distinction between Vietnamese. So that was the one rule. Now you can have, you can have a Vietnamese priest in a particular parish and that Vietnamese priest can say a mass in Vietnamese maybe once a week on Sunday. Okay, one mass in the afternoon on Sunday, or if he can travel to some place a little bit farther and have a mass for them, but no independent, no autonomous, separate parish for the Vietnamese, right? Whereas in other dioceses in the United States, that are, for example, Texas and Louisiana, you have separate Vietnamese parish, totally Vietnamese, Vietnamese pastor and the whole life, the whole life of the parish are all in Vietnamese. Mass, sacraments, music, everything, architecture, everything in Vietnamese. So you have two very different policies. In hindsight, in hindsight, I found that the policy of the bishops in California was very wrong-headed. Why? Because in San Jose, there was a large group of Vietnamese at the time, in 1975. They want, they look around other dioceses, they say, why, why do they have that in Texas? Why do they have Louisiana? Why do they have it in Georgia? I'm not here. So they bought a old building, an old church, and they want to have their own priest. So they got the old priest come in, right? So after a while, they, uh, priest left, did what the world, he is all retired. The bishop want to appoint a priest of the diocese to take care of that, that community, that parish, that church, not a parish, that church. And the people say, no, this is our church. We bought our own money. It belongs to us. We can do anything. No, but we don't want any, any priest we want. We take it, but not the one appointed by him. Now, his name is unfortunate, Pierre Dumain. It's a French name. Now, the, all the colonialism, imperialism that Vietnam suffered from 1885 to 1956, uh, 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 almost 100 years. Huh? And that come back because his name is Pierre, which is French, Dumain is French also. So they use it. They said, you are now like a colonialist. You impose your old priest to us. So the uh, Bishop Dumain excommunicated, put an interdict, we say in canon law, put an interdict on that church. No sacrament, nothing you can, anything perform that is not valid, no marriage, no Eucharist and so forth. And so they come to this point, the two pro fight, fighting is terrible. It's very sad, very sad, because um, they shouldn't be that way. No Vietnamese Elsa would do like that. And so um, eventually, eventually, the parish was dissolved. The, uh, the church was, the church, the parish center was sold and give back the money. And now all the Catholic in that place went to different uh, places. A student of mine uh, was the pastor of the next parish, and all of a sudden he has five or six thousand people come to his parish for Sunday mass. He said, "Oh my God, what can I do here?" 
And all of a sudden, all the people who went to mass that place, now it's, it's sold and disbanded, came to his parish. I said, oh my God, you'll get a lot of chance to make a lot of collection. Make sure you make collection of all the five, 6,000 Vietnamese people who come to your parish. So that, that consolation. So that is the story. Yes. Um, okay. Um, well, it, let me follow that up with another question that's kind of related to that. Um, uh, someone is asking, what's the distinction? Because in, in your the title of your lecture, you made a distinction between Vietnamese American versus American Vietnamese. Yeah, right. Uh, and and somebody is asking you to to talk about oh. that because I think it has a directly to do with this what you've just been discussing, like how how much should yeah. should they be expected to assimilate to American culture, and how much of their Vietnamese culture should they hang on to? Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you picked up the distinction. I'm so glad you did and gave me a chance to explain. If you use the Vietnamese as a noun and America as an adjective qualifying a noun, what is important is the Vietnamese, the noun. American Vietnamese. The main point is Vietnamese and the other is America is something attached to it. Now, this is very often the case where the first, maybe second generation, first or second generation, they are very proud of being Vietnamese. They speak Vietnamese, they they eat Vietnamese food, they have all the Vietnamese customs. So in that case, I would say they are American Vietnamese. But as we move to the third generation on, now most of you, if you are Vietnamese, you are born here, you went to high school here. Most of you probably do not speak English, uh, Vietnamese at all, maybe a few words, but not more. Uh, most of you eat Vietnamese uh, American food, uh, celebrate Vietnamese, uh, uh, American customs. In that case, you become a Vietnamese American. The f- emphasis on American, and the Vietnamese are kind of qualifying that. So by using that, I, uh, I, I contrast between two phases, not different, two phases of incorporation association into the American culture. At first, you will maintain your Vietnamese identity very strongly. Vietnamese language, food, culture, music, and everything else, dress and so forth. So American Vietnamese, but unavoidably, Unavoidably, uh, people thought it was more American because they are born here, they speak English, they prefer American music, American dancing, and so forth. In that case, I would say you are a Vietnamese American, the emphasis. Now, as I said, it's a question of phasing and uh, of phase and emphasis, not a contra, not a, a total difference, because you can never abandon your Vietnamese uh, Asian uh, uh, outside. I mean, unless you are mixed marriage, you have. But uh, as you know, in the last few months after the uh, the the, the uh, murder of the women in Georgia. There is a strong anti-Asian racism. A friend of mine has just published a book of Asian anti-Asian racism. He detailed all these stories of how even though you want to be American, you can never be a fully American. Um. I have another question from one of my students, uh, Javier asks, how violently were Vietnamese Catholics in Vietnam persecuted in the 1800s? Mm -hmm. Uh, He's asking some examples of that. Um, uh, Maybe a a tag on question there too is uh, Mm -hmm. what what effect does it have to go from being persecuted to then kind of being favored by the colonial powers? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, a uh, very good question. As I said, the strong persecution of the Vietnamese Catholics started in 1820 and ended somewhere in 1880. So about 55, 60 years. How many of them were killed? Well, the numbers uh, were unreliable. Someone say a few hundred thousand. But we know for a fact that in 1998, Pope John Paul II, now St. John Paul II, canonized 117 Vietnamese martyrs. 
170, many of them were uh, foreign missionaries, but also many of them, the majority are Vietnamese. So at that time, then, you have a strong, very atrocious, ferocious persecution of Vietnamese. Now, I mentioned the fact that the communists, uh, sorry, the French government used that as an excuse to enter into Vietnam and occupy Vietnam in 1887. So that's the time that uh, the Fra uh, French government come in and occupy Vietnam from 1887 to 1954. So a bit uh, over a century of, Vietnam, uh, of French colonization. Now, during this period, it was a hundred years or so, the Vietnamese Catholicism became the favored, uh, very much favored by the colonial government. Uh, because, as I said, those two churches, you see the churches, the cathedral in Hanoi and the cathedral in Saigon were built with French money, uh, French money. Uh, and uh, up to uh, 19... 30 or so, all the Vietnamese bishops, all the bishops in Vietnam were foreigners. Only then you have the first three Vietnamese bishops uh, canonized, uh, no, no, ordained by Pope uh, Pius XII. So during this time, the Vietnamese Catholic Church was very much favored by uh, the government. Uh, for example, many Catholic high schools were run by the Christian brothers. The most famous of them all, the one in Hanoi, among in Hue, and when she got three, uh, uh, most famous high school were run by the Christian brothers, or French. Uh, I remember very well when I grew up, I spoke French as a little boy, and uh, that's what we are supposed to do. Um, Vietnamese is language we speak at home, but at school, everything is in French. Um, the same thing in terms of hospitals, healthcare, the best, the very best hospitals were run by the sister of St. Paul de Chartres. Uh, they are working in, in hospitals. So when the Buddhists look at it, they say, well, you know, this is unfair. You know, the best churches you pay for by the you know, two cathedrals paid by the French, the best school run by the French, the best hospital by the French. Yeah, we have to recognize that there will benefit that the Catholic Church um, did not hesitate to take advantage of. And then Leo, when the communists came, then we paid the price. <laughs> And the Communists came 1954 in the, in, the, in the North and 1975 in the South. Uh, 20 years later, all the Catholic schools, Catholic hospitals are all confiscated by the Communist government. So, as I said, be careful when you play with one government. Uh, one government can say, uh, I, I, if they want to say something like this, but today uh, the Orthodox Church in Russia are uh, very much favored by Putin. Putin pay a lot of money to build churches and so forth. But be careful, you are bought. You may be bought. And so that danger is, is, uh, is the same thing, if I may say so, also with the uh, American Catholic Church, American Pentecostal Church, and the world Evangelical Church. You take advantage, you, you, you receive many benefits from the government. You have to pay back one way or another. And often not in a nice way. Oof, boy, that is a lesson that I wish Christians around the world would hear loud and clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so you know, we have more questions. Um, if, if you're willing to, to ask some more, we, we probably, yeah. um, we've got probably about 20 minutes. We should wrap up by 8 o'clock, but I'm going to get to as many questions as I possibly can. Um, one uh, comment, uh, Cuba is still a communist country. You didn't count uh, Cuba. So so four four countries. No, well, uh, let me say this. Uh, uh, communism in Cuba uh, is very different from the communism in Vietnam in China. So uh, that uh, I, in one of my books, I mentioned Cuba, but today I kind of hesitate to mention Cuba as a communist country. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, so we have a, a 
couple, I'm going to combine a couple of questions because I think they're related and they're related to what you were just talking about. Um, uh, one question is how do you explain the high number of vocations to the priesthood mm -hmm. and religious life among Vietnamese Catholics in the U.S.? And another question, how do you, which I think is related, how do you explain the high percentage of Catholics among the Vietnamese in the United States? Okay. Let me take the second question first, easy to answer. Now, the Catholics in Vietnam, the Vietnamese Catholics, had very bad experience with the communists, with the communists in 1954. In 1954, the communists took over North Vietnam. The uh, Geneva Conference, which took place in 1954, the Geneva Conference, divided Vietnam into two parts. The North, under the communist government, the South, under the Western or democratic government, with the possibility of exchange. That is, those in the North that do not want to have communists can come to the South, and those vice versa, those people who do not want to have the democratic government in the South can go to the North. In 1954, almost a thousand, uh, sorry, almost one million Vietnamese from the North came down to the South. Now, if you know a little bit, any of you are familiar with Dr. Tom Dooley? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, he was a medical doctor. He was very much involved in bringing a lot of Vietnamese in the north to the south. So one million about them. And they said maybe 800,000 of them were Catholics. Imagine I was all of a sudden the south was in Corongo flooded with Catholics. So there were more Catholics in Han, in the north than in the south. The south, very few Catholics. All of a sudden they came here, oh my God, there are almost a million of them. So the bishop had to take care of churches and parishes. That was a, a tremendous uh, uh, challenge for the south, okay? 1975, 20 years later, the same thing. Who would leave Vietnam? The people who had left the North in 1954, if they are still alive and their children would flee because of the communists. That explains why in the United States, 30% more of Vietnamese Americans are Catholics, whereas in Vietnam, about 7%. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Sure. For those who have experience of communism, oh, oh, we know, we won't stay here, we leave. We left 1954, we live again in 1975. They're willing to lose everything to go. That's our first question. So yeah. the other question was about the high percentage yes. of vocations amongst yes. those. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, it's a complex question. I like to um, do not want to belittle the, uh, the sincerity of the vocation. But one thing that has happened is that in Vietnam, if you want to have education, if you want to have promo social promotion, the best way, if not the only way, but the best way is to be a priest. Similarly, for a woman, in order to earn respect and uh, dignity and all that, the best way is to be a nun. Now, by no means do I imply that Vietnamese go to the priesthood because they want to be promoted socially or Vietnamese women go to be a nun. No, I'm saying that this is the cultural context, the cultural context in which uh, the Vietnamese hold um, the vocations. Now, just to give an example, an example to see. If a man has a boy and then a young man became a Catholic, a Catholic priest, Catholic priest. The very day his son or their son is ordained, he acquired a new title. Immediately, the people gave him a new title. In Vietnamese, Ong meaning mister. Ong Ko meaning grandfather. So the person who has a son who is ordained a priest is 
automatically raised to a higher level of grandfather. Everybody call him a grandfather, even though he's only 50 or 60 years old, you see. So there is, therefore, a social recognition of this vocation. Now, that's one reason. I do not, by no means do I want to say that this is the predominant motive. Of, but those of us who are involved in religious formation, uh, seminarian formation, we were reminded that we need to quote unquote test the vocation. What is the reason why you become a priest? Huh? Uh, another example, uh, just to show you how high is the Vietnamese uh, priest is regarded. Uh, from 1975 to about 2000, okay, 35 years about, when the Catholic Church was under the, com uh, the, the control, very much strict control of communism, the number of seminary is very, very restricted. Every diocese is allowed to have five priests only, five vocations. And you have a seminary, and you are a bishop of a diocese, they say, okay, you can send five, maximum five, no more. Uh, only when these five become priests, then you can send in other five. So it's very restricted. So becoming a priest, not only in the religious sense, but also in the social political sense is a great achievement. You are one of five of the entire diocese, you see. And so when that person is, is ordained, there will be weeks of celebration, not days, not days, weeks of celebration. Celebration for him, for his parents, for his cousin, his uncle, his aunt, every, the entire village celebrate that. He's carried on the shoulder, on the throne. Oh, we achieve. Our village has got a priest. It's amazing. It's just amazing. I remember very well in those years to have someone. And then, you know, and this is a true story. I won't tell you the name, but I will tell you a true story. There was a seminarian. He was ordained to be a priest. Okay. And the bishop told him, said, well, if you want to be a priest, you have to give me $2,000. Now, you remember in 1976, 77, $2,000. What for? So I can pay the government to allow an extra one, right? Instead of five, you have one extra, $2,000. And so this man wrote to his uncle in Philadelphia, who was a priest, said, you know, for me to be ordained a priest, I need $2,000, the bishop said. You know what the uncle told me personally? He said, if he asked me a hundred thousand, maybe I don't have it, but two thousand dollars I can give him the next day. So he sent him two thousand dollars back, and that young man was so then in the priest. That sounds like the city of Chicago, the way things <laughs> work around here. Yeah, <laughs> Just right. gotta pay somebody off. Um, one quick, uh, very quick question: Can you give us the title of that book? on anti-Asian uh, racism. Is that Jonathan Tran's book? No, no, no. It, uh, it's by Joe, G-O-E, Joe Chia. Joe Chia, uh, uh, C-H-E-A. The title is Anti-Asian Racism. It's going, it's going to appear, it's already in print, but it's going to appear by Orbis Books. Okay. Thank you. So let me combine. So I, I, I think we've only got about 10 minutes left. I'm going to try to get as many as questions as I can. I'm going to combine three questions uh, together here. Uh, Greg asks, I am very surprised by the majority of population in folk religions. In Africa, folk religions are shrimping, shrinking rapidly mm -hmm. relative to the growth in Christianity. So in Africa, you've got People are abandoning uh, African traditional religions and, and joining Christianity or, in some mm -hmm. cases, Islam. Mm -hmm. Let me link that to another couple of questions. One is from a Filipino-American pastor and Nepal alum. Uh, 
have you observed many Vietnamese or Vietnamese American Catholics rejecting Christianity because of its ties to colonialism mm -hmm. in order to embrace pre-Christian or pre-colonial mm -hmm. religious practices? Mm -hmm. So in, in Africa, everybody thought once colonialism ended, people were going to abandon Christianity and the opposite happened. Right. Um, and so he's asking about, uh, have, have anybody, have people re rejected Christianity because of its colonial past? Mm -hmm. in uh, Vietnam. And then a, a third question, uh, was Catholicism initially introduced in Vietnam as a vehicle of co colonialism, or was it simply to spread the word of God? So so sorry, but I'm, I'm going to throw those three questions at you and see if you can just okay. talk. Let me answer the first question, the last question first. At the beginning, in the 17th century, there was no interest in colonizing Vietnam. The Portuguese, as you know, have no interest in colonizing. The only interest they have is trade, trade, buying and selling. And if they do that, they don't care about the land, okay? Very different from the Spanish. The Spanish is different. In South America, they occupy the land. The Portuguese in Asia, Except little Macau, little, they have no interest in, domin in, in colonizing the land, but the trade. So in the first 17th century, 18th century, the, 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 the uh, colonial project didn't happen. Only at the, towards the third half, the third half of the 19th century, you had the French. The French was colonizers, not the Portuguese. The French were colonizers, and therefore they run the the, uh, uh, the, the, the country like as if it is a uh, department outremer. They say a uh, overseas department. You know how France is divided into departments, and Vietnam was a department of overseas department outremer. And so the question, answer your question is that it's only the 19th century. Uh, 19th century that you have the connection between colonialism and Catholicism. So now, second, that clear? Okay. This question regarding the whether the, I know of anyone who reject Christianity because of colonialism, not so much rejection, but not entering, not converting to Catholicism. And this is true very much in the North. Uh, under the communism, so a lot of people refuse to become baptized but Catholic because of this heritage of colonialism. There are some, not many, not many, but there are some, especially intellectuals, uh, government officials, intellectuals who refuse to be baptized, even though they think that Christianity is a good religion because of this. So that's the answer, not en masse. Um, not always, not in the 17th nor 18th century, but more in the 19th century, half of 19th century and half of the 20th century. The first question is a very insightful question, very, very insightful question, because as uh, we all know that in Africa, uh, they said, well, you know, you became a Christian because of the French or the Belgian or the, the not to something, uh, but uh, uh, if they leave, Catholicism would collapse. The opposite is true. The opposite is that the number of uh, Christianity has increased. Um, I talk very uh, in my writing. I talk about the uh, uh, northern uh, hemisphere and the southern hemisphere uh, in another 25 years. In another 29 by 2050. Three fourth, three fourth of Christians live in the hemisphere of the south, southern hemisphere. That is Asia, Africa, and Latin America. But let's notice very important: the great conversion in Africa right now is not to Catholicism but to Pentecostalism. The tremendous boom of Christian Christian conversion in Africa uh, more in Pentecostal. Yes, the Catholicism, but not as strong as in the Pentecostal uh, religions. 
particular religion that have what we call the prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel. In other words, whatever they were looking for in the tribal religions or uh, indigenous religions, they couldn't find. They found it promised to them in the evangelical and Pentecostal churches. This is something we need uh, to, to think. So, yes, I agree that um, uh, with the uh, demise of colonialism, uh, there, there was no automatic reduction in Catholicism. But the increase is much more complex than say, oh, they all become Christians. Okay, so Peter, I'm going to ask you one more uh, short question. Um, we have a, a question asking, has Rome acknowledged the Lady of Lavang as an official apparition? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> but in Vienna, even the Vietnam bishop do not officially recognize that. Well, as I mentioned to you, that we didn't have historical evidence. No, it's all record. It's just in the old tradition. What I tell you, you can read my book in our own tongues. In our own tongues, there is one chapter on Our Lady the Lava. You want to need to all the historical things there, you should read that. I, I can read for you, but in our own tongues, in my book, and you have the chapter on uh, the uh, devotion, uh, Mary in Vietnamese Piety and Theology, chapter six of this book here, uh, in our own tongue. If you have it, you can have it all if you're interested, writing a paper, research paper, and so forth. So in answer to you is Rome has not recognized that. The Vietnamese hierarchy has not officially recognized that, but by participating in this annual celebration in Vietnam, as I said, hundred, over 100,000 people, uh, all the bishops who could go and went and so forth, by their participation, they recognize there is something here that is not simply can be dismissed as just simply propaganda. Okay. Um, all right. I said I was not going to ask you one more question, but I'm going to ask you um, for a 30-second response to this one because I think it's a really interesting question. It's a huge question. But the question uh, is how do – how do the Vietnamese Catholics differ from other Western Catholics? So if you had to say one thing that is is specific yeah. to yes. Vietnamese Catholicism. I will. I will. Else, else. The only greatest difference is that the popular devotions. Popular devotions. And if you want to know what popular devotion is, I have another book. I've written about it. I can recommend, I recommend it to you. Popular devotion, not in this, not in this book. The other book is called uh, "Being Religious Interreligiously." There's a chapter on popular devotions. Yeah, if that. Oh, by the way, that is not unique to the Vietnamese. It's the same. We call it Iberian Catholicism, Iberian spirituality, Spain and Portugal. So the Vietnamese, the Mexicans, Latin Americans are very, very similar in this devotion, popular devotion to Mary, to the saints, right? Popular devotions. So this is something that people, this is what kept the faith alive during the communist regime. The priests were not allowed to perform mere sacraments and no preaching. What kept the faith alive? The rosary. The devotion to Mary, devotion to the saints every day. You don't need a priest to do that. They can say it at home. Uh, they can teach the kid at home who is uh, Jesus, who is the uh, Mary and Joseph and all that. So I would say yes to the question. You, you. Uh, I don't want to go oversimplify, but I think this is what's so distinctive about Vietnamese Catholicism. Uh, as and Filipino Catholics, identical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Filipino Vietnam because they are the same missionaries, the Spaniards and the Portuguese in Vietnam, the Spaniards in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so Karen has we, before we we thank you and say good night. Karen has a couple of slides uh, and Marlon a couple of slides to to put on. Um, so go ahead and and do that um, about some upcoming events. 
uh, in our immigrant Catholicism series, uh, next one on Mexican American Catholics, then on Filipino American Catholics, uh, which is just uh, what we were talking about, and then uh, African American Catholics and the great migration from the south to the north. So please join us for those if you can. And World Catholicism Week is on young people and global Catholicism uh, this year. And that's, again, all online, so please uh, join us if you can uh, for that. There's one more slide, I think, which uh, has a QR code for um, to tell us what you, th what you think. Uh, everybody's always asking you to fill out a survey, but if you happen to have a couple of minutes, uh, please do that uh, for us uh, tonight. Um, thank you so much for your questions. I'm sorry I almost got to all of them, but there's a couple that I did not, so my apologies to those who didn't get your questions answered. Um, but um, we're so grateful to you, Peter, for uh, this really fascinating talk and the uh, uh, just wonderful question and answer period. I could go on for another hour, but I think we need to let you um, let you go and uh, not tax you anymore. But um, please join me in thanking uh, Father Peter Fan for this terrific uh, talk, and uh, thank you all for uh, attending as well, and please join us for, for our future events. Okay, Bill. See you. Thanks, okay. Peter. Yeah. I hope to see you sometime in person. I hope so, too. Yeah. I very much yeah. hope so, too. Good night, everyone. Good night.